Okay, um, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for inviting me up here. Um, I've been doing NEC for 25 years. I've never ever tried to put something together specifically on subcontracting, which is slightly odd, really. Um, there are some people in the room who've heard most of this before, but that's another story. Um, that's me. I've got my 30th birthday recently. That's the only thing that's changed on that slide, and I've still got the same time. Um, repeating a personal plea that I made at one of the two conferences, I can't remember which one it was last year. In the room, can we please get in the habit of saying along the supply chain and not down the supply chain? Just as a general thought. Who does all the bloody work in our industry? Talk to me. The subcontractors. <laughs> let's, let's respect them and get, use our language to try and respect them. Um, the basic structure of what we're doing here is what's in the contracts, the options for a contractor in setting up a subcontract. A lot of people in the room know all this and know all this better than me. So some of it's going to be pretty dull, let's be honest about it. Most of my training is pretty dull. But please chip in comments as we, as we go along. Um, but firstly, what is a subcontractor? Well, as I say in my training, what are you going to have to do at this point? Read the chuffing contract. So section ACC3, you all know that. You've seen that before. You're all working with that, I'm guessing. Provide a service necessary to provide the work. Anybody had any debates on this in the industry? <laughs> Go on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Labour-only subcontractors. Exactly. <laughs> well, maybe NEC4 might have... Because that's clearly providing a service, isn't it? Rob should have stuck his hand up because he was on the other side. <laughs> Is that right? OK. Um, Good question. Well, I would argue, clearly, they are providing a service necessary to provide the works. And yet somebody will say, well, hang on, back in the schedule of cost components, there's a very clear implication that we're going to pay them, whatever it is, what, number 14 or something, in the schedule of cost components, that will pay them as a direct cost to the contractor. The, the other issue, which is not on the slides anywhere, but is this whole the fancy the whole working area overhead. We all know the working area overhead, don't we? Yes, Richard. And therefore, there's an incentive for a contractor to convince the project manager that this person doing the cleaning is a subcontractor. And because they're a subcontractor, we can get them paid specifically. So the very definition of a subcontractor is clearly going to be important and potentially cause issues. NEC4 has changed that quite substantially. ECC4, I should say. Construction install is still there. Design all or part of it, except the design of plant and materials carried out by the supplier. I've put it in bold, but it's not defined. A supplier, in my interpretation, is basically somebody who isn't a subcontractor. They haven't made that to the, the lofted height of a subcontractor. But that does mean that if there's a significant design being done by the subcontractor, does that mean if they're going to get that done by a tier three somebody else, does that mean that the subcontractor is not a subcontractor anymore? Because based on the wording there, the design is being done by a supplier. Somebody can cope with that logic. It's, even now, it's not going to be totally simple. But what they have done, to answer John's point, they've chopped out higher equipment and people paid by the contractor, dot, dot, dot. So I think I've said the supplier, yes. And that last bit, the, the last bit is directly linked by Settle the cost components 14. We're not going to pay you as a subcontractor. We're going to pay those people employed. I mean, the words are exactly the same. People employed by the contractor called, paid, sorry, according to the time they work. Okay, so we worked out what a subcontractor is. So bloody what? What's the implication of whether somebody is a subcontractor rather than not a subcontractor as far as the engineering and construction contract is concerned? My summary, I may have missed some, please drop them in if I miss them. Firstly, the contractor needs to ask nicely to use this subcontractor. It doesn't have to ask nicely to use a supplier. I've got a job in Bangladesh at the moment, not NEC unfortunately, where it's a pipeline job. 90% of the money is in the pipe. So the supply of that pipe is bloody significant, but they're not a subcontractor. Unless you write something in the scope, there's no obligation to ask nicely about that supplier. You see where I'm coming from, this subtle difference between subcontractor and supplier. Fee percentage in ECC3, we've got two separate fee percentages, and we've got a horrible 
mess in ECC3 about how we pay the defined cost of subcontractors, which I'll talk about. So process for acceptance. You all know this. This is dull as dishwater, but for some that don't know, maybe it's worth it. We've got to ask nicely, can I use that particular subcontractor? And my only PM's only reason, remember we've got to have a stated reason in the contract if we want to not accept something, otherwise compensation event, the only reason is that they will not allow the contractor to provide the works. PMs out there, have you got involved and told your contractor not to use this particular subcontractor on any real jobs? Talk to me. Yes, no? Must be there somewhere, I'm sure. Uh, the closest well, I've just got what? Is, is sort of a health warning. Health warning, exactly. Right so the, so the top full on rejection. Exactly. So the top tip, you've got a problem with that sub because you know something the contractor doesn't know. What are you going to do in NEC? Early warning, talk to me, we'll have a chat. Do you really want to use those guys? They're a bunch of waste if you've seen what they're doing just down the road. That's what we should be doing in terms of the help. Important point though is that that words allow the contractor to provide the works. Provide the works is a defined term, means do everything which the contract requires, includes the works information or scope now in NEC4. And therefore, if there are any constraints on the subcontracting in the works information, then that bullet point allows, if the, if, the, if the proposed subcontractor does not meet those constraints, that bullet point is applicable and allows the PM to not accept the subcontractor. We then go into the former subcontract. Again, the only reason for not accepting a former subcontract, they don't have the lovely words, allow the contractor to provide the work, sorry, that's not the lovely words. The other lovely words are, include that wonderful 10.1 statement. Very easy for a contractor to patch in a 10.1 statement on top of his generally subby bashing um, subcontract that he might... There's lots of chuckles in the room for that one. Not, not that you contractors would have any subby bashing... Stat no, you wouldn't, would you? Any, you wouldn't do that, no, obviously. Um, and then in NEC 3, it's a bit of a mess. 26.4, cost-based contracts, so this is in option C, D, E, F, is also got to give you the contract data. Said that one. But... Do all, do all subcontracts have a contract data? They don't, do they? 90% of the, of the contracts used for subcontractors in your jobs, well, not, maybe not 90%, a significant portion are not NEC, and therefore contract data may well be completely meaningless. So, guess what? It's better in NEC 4. Name is the same, form of subcontract, form of, you've got to submit the form of subcontract, accept any pricing information. Lowercase, the law will define what pricing information is, but it's pretty obvious. And then, of course, if you have got a cost-based contract, NEC 4 now says, I'd like to see also the pricing information. But that pricing information, interestingly, is for information only. There's no reason for the PM to accept or not accept it. Who's spending the money? Option C in training. I always get my wallet here and say, option C, here, take my money. Is the basic premise of option Z. So there's nothing, if the contractor proposes a subcontract with a ridiculously high pricing information, directly there's not a reason for rejecting that form of subcontract, that, sub, that proposed subcontract. You're going to have to go back and argue that that's not defined cost, it's not 52.1 compet competitively tendered or market rates, I think. Contractors in the room, do you have somebody who looks after subcontracting on your project? Probably. They probably have a procurement plan or a subcontracting plan or something. Be aware NEC does not have that. NEC just has this meticulous one by one asking nicely, can I use the subby? Logically, I'd hope to think you would, if you don't do it already, take it away, you will keep a 22.2 list on your job to make sure it's clear where we've got to in terms of accepting or not accepting the proposed subcontractors. Simple. NEC 3 got two fee percentages. Therefore, it matters whether or not this entity is a subcontractor or just a supplier. Because for options ECC 3, as you all know, I'm sure, we use the defined cost for all compensation events for all options and we use defined costs for the cost-based options. So NEC 3, I've always said, I don't know where I got it from, but I was told 
that when we went from NEC, 3, NEC 2 to NEC 3, subcontractors asked for two separate fee percentages. Does anyone know where that's true? I don't know. That's where I got it from. They wanted more flexibility in giving different fee percentages for different types of work. So the way NEC 3 work, ECC 3 works, we've got two different fee percentages put on top of different types of defined costs, whether it's subcontractors or not subcontractors. You know all this. This is all straightforward stuff for NEC specialists like yourself. But even in ECC3, there's only one subcontractor fee percentage, and maybe the contractor might have liked to have different fee percentages for different subbies. And anybody done tender evaluation on this? It's a pain in the bottom, because in your tender evaluation, which you've got to be clear and clear about what you're going to do, to apply those two different fee percentages, you're going to have to make a completely wild stab at how much is going to go through to subcontractors rather than main contractors, which I'm sure is a leading reason why ECC4, it's all easy. Single fee percentage, one applied to all defined cost. No problem at all. Again, I'm sure most of you know this one, but this is picking it up. This is another issue with subcontracting. ECC3, on the lump sum contracts, when do we need defined cost? Only for compensation. talk to me, compensation events. Thank you. I just like to have people talking to me. I don't like talking out to nobody. <laughs> just talk to me. We need a comp so we use for compensation events. Defined cost is shorter schedule of cost components, whether work is subcontracted or not. Does anybody know out there how much their subcontractor pays their joiner? Do you? But if you've got an option A job, you're going to have to find out in theory. Shorter schedule of cost components has this lovely line saying, the schedule means the contractor and not his subcontractor for C, D, E, C, D and E, and sort of by implication, but it's, it's a bit twisted, but it's clearly in the definition that for subcontractors, we're going to use the shorter schedule of cost components. So in options A and B, we're going to use a shorter schedule of cost components for subcontractors, and most of that's real cost. Hence my question, do you know how much the subcontractor pays his joiner? Do you really care how much the subcontractor pays his joiner? Probably not. So that's the way we're going to have to do things. So firstly, from a contractor's perspective, you're going to have to pay out, in theory, the subcontractor's defined costs in the subcontract, assuming you're using an NEC subcontract here, plus the direct fee percentage. You're going to get paid the same subcontract defined cost plus your subcontract fee percentage. So you've clearly got to make allowance in your subcontracted fee percentage for whatever fee percentage you're going to have to pay out at the subcontract. Pretty obvious. The problem is, is it a problem? I don't, you tell me, you guys are doing it for real. The contract requires you, as a contractor, to show the project manager the subcontractor's real cost of his people. Does that ever happen? Lots of heads being shaken around the So we're all breaking the rules. Does it really happen? I don't think so. Um, Luckily, beautifully, NEC4, again, has fixed this problem. It's now allowing payments to subcontractors, which is just common sense. So subcontractor comes to you with their compensation and quotation. You ultimately are going to pass on now a single fee percentage on top of that quotation from the subby, which becomes part of the defined cost of the contractor. So hopefully, that bit should be a lot easier in NEC4. Moving on quickly. Has anybody been in a situation where the client is interested in who you as a contractor are going to use as subcontractors? Yeah, because the clients are now wanting to collect the team, aren't they? So we can collaborate using the supply chain, all these lovely words. But NEC's got no clear way, unless you tell me otherwise, of building those proposed subcontractors into the contract. You could ask the contractor to include those in his scope provided by the contractor. And then I ask the question, why the hell does that still say for its design? Why can't we just say scope provided by the contractor? If it's design, then fine. Or, and I've talked this through with others in NEC land, 
I think a, a recommendation to clients, a simple Z clause, <gasps> shock horror, Z clause, using the same language for key people but for key subcontractors. In which case, you would have to use that key subcontractor unless you could propose an alternative subcontractor who was colloquially as good as the original and accepted by the PM. So that's a recommendation to clients if we are trying to get contractors to use the, the subcontractors that they promised they're going to use. Hope that makes sense. Typical Z clauses, those sort of things. I'm going to have to move on. How am I doing on time? 12, 30, 12, 15. We've got um, 10 minutes. 10 minutes, fine. So keep going. Typically have, uh, particularly in public sector clients, there's more obligations on contractors to pay on time. And now there is a big drive, as you might have noticed, from central government at least, to huge project bank accounts. There, you, you can't help but notice there is an ongoing issue in our industry of trying to make sure subbies get paid. Um, big issue for contractors, because you big contractors, you survive on your 3% profit margins because you're making a decent return on capital because you are, technical term, screwing your subcontractors. If we're going to change that, we've got to change the whole model of the industry. Move on. So packaging. You're a subcontractor, you've got to get the job done. You've got a scope from your client. You say, I'm going to sub that bit, sub that bit, sub that bit, and DIY a little bit. It's not rocket science to realise as soon as you do that, you've got interfaces to manage between the subcontractors, between yourself and the subcontractors. Simple. Options. I think the options are, I'll use the ECS, Engineering Construction Subcontract, I'll use the short subcontract, maybe the short supply, if it is just supply, which is delivery, no insulation on those contracts, or maybe I'll still use my own standard because I've been using it for years and they know it. I keep linking up over here. Yeah, you wouldn't do that, no. So, simple few sides between comparing ECS versus a short contract. Again, most of you, I'm hoping, know this, but let's just have a chat, see how it goes. And of course, it's really comparing the ECC against the short contract, because they're exactly the same, barring a few timescales. <coughs> Clearly, complex as a short contract is designed for simple stuff, we know, whereas the ECS is absolutely word for word, back to back, with the main ECC contract. Payment, all the flexibility in ECC that we know, of short contract, we've got a price list, and the price list can be a mix of quantity times rate and lump sum items. More of that in a minute. Loads of secondary options, whereas in a short contract, there aren't any options at all. It's just straight off the shelf, but it's built in delay damages, retention, and some words to add in if you need a YUK2 um, option. Risk pass through. There's nothing to stop an option C main contractor using option A for his subcontracts. It's fairly normal. Um, but the back-to-back -back process is, should be exactly back-to-back -back on compensation events. Big issue with e the short contract is the, the pricing risk. Another slide coming for it, I think, in just a minute. Some subtle differences on compensation events, the most obvious one being weather. Clear one in 10 on the ECC it's more simple, in theory, on the short contract, but it's, it's a, there's a mismatch. So as a contractor, you ought to be aware that there is a mismatch. Big issue here, I think, on timing, given all those interfaces, you remember you're a contractor, you've got to get these subbies working together and doing things for each other. In the ECC, you've got sectional completion, you've got delay damages, you've got key dates. In the ECS, you've got nothing. It's just complete the works. So if your short contract has various short little bits to interface with other contractors, you've got a problem. You have to start adding in words to make that work. But then your short contract becomes the less short contract and the less simple contract, and you're in danger of uh, having problems. The design is an interesting one that I cropped up when preparing for this session. You've got very simple process, 21.2, submit and accept designs. Very, very, even more basic in the short contract. And I would say the short contract is not appropriate if you've got significant contractor design. Stupid, I think, in the short contract, this little guy that you're getting to do a little bit of work, if you get him to do some design, that design is fit for purpose as standard. There's no X15 there. 
So subbies need to know that, and I think contractors should be adding in an X15 if they're trying to use a short subcontract, if you're a grown-up contractor. Program is a big difference, of course. Massively detailed in ECC, very, very simple, very, very basic in the short contract. Got to move on. So ECS itself, we all know employer, project manager, contractor suddenly becomes the contractor. You are God. You are project manager, supervisor, and employer for this subcontract. Language changes, but apart from that, there's language, a sl slide of language changing, but fundamentally the principles of the contract, the ECS, are exactly the same as the big one. There are changes to time periods only, which make it all work together. That's just a takeaway slide showing how those changes work. I'm not going to try and go through the detail, but you've got an extra week when you're getting something from a subby in principle to pass it on along to the left. The supply chain, I nearly said up there. I nearly said up, no, along. Issues with that, what causes problems on all contracts? Scope, scope, scope. Contractors need to be realizing that they are writing contracts. Their people need to be understanding how to write scope. We can pass things through. Usual problem, if the contractor's got a significant delay damage, can you really pass that through onto all your little subbies, even though those little subbies might well be on the critical path? Is that going to stack up? Also, you've got to tell the contractor what you're going to provide to them. Time interfaces, as I've mentioned, in ECS, you've got the options of sections and key dates. Why don't we use X12? Contractors! Surely you're supposed to be encouraging collaboration, joining up, working with your subcontractors. Has any subcontractor in the room ever used X12 with his, their supply chain? Don't all shout at once. Just a thought for discussion later, perhaps. I put our quote on LinkedIn, on the, on the discussion group at the start of this. Anything to share? The main line I got was this one. It's too bloody hard. 80% of submissions come in without a completely contract data part two. Brackets, they haven't got a chuffing clue. That's the basic summary I got. Is that? I'm seeing some nodding in the audience. Because we're all here. Hands up, subcontractors in the room. Hands up. Oh, brilliant. Four. That's probably, a, that's probably more than usual. Good effort. Make yourself known in discussions. Short contract. I'll knock this briefly. Let's use a short contract a lot more. Clients should be using a short contract a lot more. They still use ECC when they should be using a little one. But in the case of the short subcontract, subbies beware. The main issue, like I said, the prices, it's not an activity schedule, it's not a bill of quantities. We've got a thing called the prices, and it's a mix of lump sums and quantity times rate. Normally set up by the buyer, in other words, the contractor, not always, but normally, there's no explicit need for a method of measurement but you might need one. Subcontractors, you're only going to get paid what it says on the price list. Fine. If those quantities are not right, and there's more quantity required, if there is a quantity times right, subcontractor, you get some more money. Lovely, fair, reasonable. But if it ain't on the price list at all, who's taking the risk? The subcontractor. Because you've still got to do it, because it's in the works information or the scope in EC4. So subcontractors need to be really, really aware of that little subtlety. If they're just confronted with a short contract and a price list, you need to train them. You need to make them understand what's right. I've mentioned the fit for purpose issue. Define cost. Yes, short contract, still people employed by the subcontractor. Subcontractor gets the so in the it's interesting in the in the main contract for options A and B ECC you get paid a price list There's, you know seeker rates is your normal way of pricing, whereas at the subcontractor he still gets the actual cost of his equipment something for a contractor to be aware of. People employed by the subcontractor, I think in most jobs where this certainly on option A we should be going for a Z clause and changing that to tendered rates day works rates effectively for the ECC contract. Compensation events, we've said, similar process. The only difference in a short contract is you don't mess about with saying, I think it's a compensation event and wait six weeks for an answer. 
You go straight in with a, I think it is, and by the way, here's my quote, trying to move things along. The weather is different, we've talked about. Take away slide for later. And like I said, for compensation events which only affect the quantities, then we go back in and use the price list. Have you had any arguments about whether this compensation event only affects the quantities? Because if it doesn't only affect the quantities, then we open the door to define cost for everything. Okay? PSC, are we interested? Have I got time? Two minutes. Same options. The contractor, you're going to imply a fine consultant like Mott McDonald. Other consultants are available. Um, you might do that through the PSC. You might do that through the professional services short contract. Um, PSC, you've got full options. And there's guidance. I'm not going to go through it here. There's guidance in the guide notes to tell you how to do that as a PSC. I wish you'd try and avoid putting in too many Z clauses at that point, I must say, as a consultant on the receiving end. Typically, there are Z clauses for the times, time periods, those sort of issues. NEC 4 now, moving forward, has actually got a stand in, out of the, uh, the box subcontract. I'll point you to this article, which I wrote way back in 2016. ECC, Contractors Design, You've got particulars of design submissions. You've got options to submit in parts. You've got clear time periods for, for review and so on. In the PSC, you've got nothing. Nothing. So in the scope, you're going to have to write out all those things. Detailed requirements for submission, time periods for response, reasons, all that stuff is in the ECC, but it's not in the PSC. The only place to put it is in the scope. If that's of interest to you, dig out that newsletter article from a long while ago. Deal's done. Management's running out of time. Program. Subcontractors here really good on producing compliant ECS programs? <laughs> chuckle, chuckle. Big issue. What do we do about it? Nothing. Uh, uh, nothing. We don't do it. What I see is contractors telling their subcontractors what their program is by giving them the main contractor's program. That's what happens in industry, isn't it? You say, here's the program, this is what you've got to do. The concept of subby actually giving you a program doesn't, in my, in my experience, it's just not happening. And yet, if you're trying to interface between subcontractors, you should be doing that, you need that. But if subcontractors can't find the resources for planning and programming, sorry, if contractors can't, what bloody hope have we got for subcontractors? Typically, like I say, all I can say in terms of top tips, if you're asking for all the answers in this presentation, you're not going to get them. The answers is Taltio, which is my line for chuffing talk and listen to each other, between contractor and subcontractor. Has anybody got any other great tips for sorting out program issues between subcontractors? Early warning. ECC has got a risk register, ECS has got the same. There's two separate risk registers going on. Short contract has got, hasn't got a risk register, but we'll certainly keep a list of early warnings, surely. Do we get subcontractors in the main contract risk reduction meeting? Say yes, Richard. Good. EC, any, the fourth edition, ECS is, is common sense. It specifically says we can get subbies in, just as a hint, it might be a good idea. Do we have a joined up early warning register across the job between main contract and subcontractors? Anybody? Don't be ridiculous, Richard. We're all separate. I don't know. Talk to each other. Any bright ideas on making the early warning process work better with subcontractors? I don't know. Apart from set up the meetings to be able to talk to each other, get the subbies into your risk reduction meetings, can we not have a joined up risk register? I don't know. Early warning register, sorry, better. Yeah. Compensation events need to be done at all levels. Deals need to be done. They're deals. They're, they're, there's no right answer to a compensation event. We're doing deals. Cost-based contracts, and now in ECC4 anyway, even in option A and B, the contractor passes on the amounts due to subbies. Simple, better in EC4. So, do we have joined up compensation meetings with subby contractor project manager? Anybody? Does that happen? Yes. yes. Tell everybody else. Make sure that should be happening. 
because why are we doing it twice and then losing you know, mixed messages, parts? just get them in the room together. That's an idea. Well done. Brilliant. Good effort. Thank you. Fundamentally, they need help. You're going to have to train them up. And the training means training up from the very, very start. Hopefully, most contractors have got a fairly well-established supply chain. How much effort are you putting in to training up your subbies to use the contracts that you're planning to bash them? Sorry, to work together and collaborate with. Hopefully, that's happening a bit more. Last slide, favourite slide. You've all seen that slide. You've probably all seen the pattern interpretation of that slide as well over the years. Shall act as stated. Sorry. Shall act as stated. Do what it says in the chuffing contract, is my summary. The lawyers have written pages. There's PhDs on this census. I don't give a damn. What matters is how it changes our way of working and ultimately collaborating. But you just signed up to a contract. The first sentence says, do what it chuffing says. That's what we've got to make sure everybody in the industry knows. You can't do that unless you first start off by reading the chuffing contract. Yeah, pretty simple. But what the hell does spirit of mutual trust and cooperation mean? Have you had that conversation with the other side on your jobs with your subcontractors? I hope so, but you probably haven't. My summary for years was chuffing talk to each other. Until in a training course, a very bright lady said to me, Richard, I think you're missing something. You're very good at talking, Richard. How about the listening? So my acronym for the industry is TALTIO, chuffing talk and listen to each other. I'll tell the story that I, I said to Veronica. I got an email from my vicar in my village. Would you like to come to some marriage reinforcement classes? Now, I know Simon very well, the vicar, and I went back and said, Simon, you know I'm a rampant atheist, so I'm unlikely to come to your marriage reinforcement classes under the, you know, under the auspices of, the, of the, um, whatever church it is. But I said... I followed up with, but may I suggest you, I share the concept developed in contracts training, the concept of Taltio for your manage, for your relationship courses. And I was really chuffed a week later to find out he had used it in his church marriage reinforcement classes. So take away Taltio. Have you got an early warning register in your relationships? <laughs> Summary. <laughs> Along the supply chain... Start with the right contract, subcontract, clear scope and interface is bloody obvious, and probably the most important thing, not wishing to set myself up or going up for a job, train and work with your subcontractors. If you're going to get them to help you do NEC projects, they're going to have to understand NEC. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, excellent presentation. If I had one criticism, Ooh. it was a little monotone. Sorry. <laughs> um, it would be unfair just not to... We're a bit tight for time, but let's just take one or two questions from Richard, specifically on subcontracting. Just quick ones. Any, any comments or... Anyone got a question? It's all too dull. Uh, one at the back. If you just shout, if you don't mind. Well, firstly, the, the schedule doesn't need a preamble. The schedule is the schedule. It's just telling you what the con contract thinks is defined cost. It's defining what cost is. Um, the problem is, as we know, that even... I always dis, dis, uh, compare the schedule of cost components with the UK tax system. It's detailed, it's meticulous, and as soon as you make it detailed and meticulous, there's still going to be holes in it, and there's arguments over what some of those little words mean. But there's no need for a separate um, preamble to it. Ex explanation to it in training, maybe, but not a separate preamble. The big issue, as I put on the slides there, is the, the, the problem in ECC3, on a lump sum job for a contractor, in theory, he's got to find the real cost of a contractor's joiner as part of his quotation for a compensation rent, which is just rubbish. And it hasn't worked for the last 10 years in the industry, as far as I know. 
and most people find a way of fudging it and putting through the subcontract invoice for the compensation. I don't know whether I answered your question, but I had fun. <laughs> Okay, well, we've got a question time panel at the end of the session, so we can maybe come back to a couple of these points. Um, the last session before lunch, um, we heard from the MHA about their using ECI um, within the Midlands Highways Alliance, and now we're going to dive into specifics around, uh, Neil's going to share with us the intricacies of ECI, and then we're going to hear from Andy on a specific example as to how they've uh, utilised it.